Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. This is Haley Kelleton from Inside Scientific and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Today's webinar is titled Initial Orthostatic Hypotension, Don't Blink or You Will Miss It, and will feature Dr. Satish Raj, Professor of Cardiac Science, and Nazia Sheikh, a student clinical researcher from his lab at the University of Calgary. Throughout this presentation, they will give an overview of initial orthostatic hypotension, describe how these patients present in the clinic, and offer some insights into non-pharmacological approaches to the management of patients with IOH from recent studies. Today's webinar is sponsored by Finipress Medical Systems. Finipress Medical Systems contributes to a better healthcare by providing hardware and software solutions for continuous, non-invasive blood pressure measurements. With their products, they assist healthcare professionals and researchers with their daily operations. Finipress specializes in research and diagnostics of autonomic functioning, and with this webinar, they want to support in spreading knowledge about initial orthostatic hypotension. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome you both, um, and thank you for being with us. And you guys can introduce yourselves and your topic now. So uh, thank you uh, all in the audience for, for attending. Um, today's topic uh, is one that's not uh, new, but I think one that has been largely um, under-recognized, both uh, on the research side and, and perhaps more importantly in the clinic, and that is of initial orthostatic hypotension. And hopefully through uh, the course of the talk, you will understand why we subtitled it, Don't Blink or You Will Miss It. Um, in today's uh, session, it's going to have two parts. Um, I will start by trying to introduce um, the uh, spectrum of orthostatic hypotension, what we think about, um, because there are other forms of orthostatic hypotension that are very important. Um, but then the bulk of the talk will really be um, Nazia Sheikh's uh, description of, of some really um, critical work that she did during her master's to help us understand both what it is and, and what to do about this disorder. So um, before getting to the crux of initial orthostatic hypotension, I think it's worth remembering that this entire area um, of problem and arguably, you know, the entire syncope clinic in which I work, um, is there because standing is a very active process. Um, and it, it, I know it doesn't seem that way um, to those that are untrained. I, most people attending this probably um, realize this already. But um, while children learn to stand up and walk and don't think about it, um, a lot of things have to happen for this to work out properly. So the normal physiology involves a significant fluid shift. Uh, we estimated at about 700 milliliters here, but the truth is that varies from individual to individual um, that occurs from the chest, the thorax to below the chest when we stand up. So there's a gravitational fluid shift and this has subsequent uh, consequences in terms of decreasing the cardiac venous return and then decreasing the cardiac output. Um, this can lead to activation of baroreceptors or pressure sensors. Um, and ultimately uh, through the these reflexes can actually alter sympathetic and parasympathetic tone. The net result of which is that when we stand up, our blood pressure usually doesn't change much under normal circumstances. Sure, if one looks really closely, the systolic may decrease a little and the diastolic may increase a little bit, but effectively there's no significant change across the population. There is a bit of an increase in heart rate that's a normal response to standing, uh, and we all do this without thinking about it. And that is until things go wrong. Um, and so when things go wrong, the, the prototypic disorder that uh, we often think about is orthostatic hypotension. Here I termed it classical orthostatic hypotension um, because there are some variants that we're going to get into. Um, so what I'll say about orthostatic hypotension is two things. Uh, and um, the first is that it's impossible to diagnose if you don't measure orthostatic vital signs. And the traditional way of doing orthostatic vital sign assessments is shown here on the left. We um, want to have a patient lying down, ideally for at least a few minutes to allow any fluid equilibration. If they just come running into clinic, uh, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take a, at least a couple of minutes. And it's important that we assess both the heart rate and the blood pressure. And this is typically done in most clinics with a typical brachial blood pressure cuff. Um, after the lying down pressure, 
Um, we can have the patient sit and get a pressure, or we can even skip that. The sitting pressure is particularly useful in if there's a concern that you won't be able to get adequate standing pressures because the patient won't be able to stand long enough. Um, but otherwise, it's not absolutely necessary. And then standing pressures, ideally at 1, 3, 5, and 10 minutes. And I've actually eliminated, if you look closely, the one minute number on the slide. And that's because it's actually the uh, least reliable with this measure of assessment. Um, the pressures can be all over the place. And by the three minute assessment, it's usually a more stable and re reliable measure. Um, and that actually has some relevance to the talk today. So you do the assessment and then orthostatic hypotension definition is on the right. It involves a drop in blood pressure of 20 millimeters in systolic pressure or 10 millimeters in diastolic pressure. Um, and for classical orthostatic hypotension, this has to occur within three minutes of standing. There is a caveat that if someone has baseline hypertension, that the threshold is a little bit higher, a drop of at least 30 millimeters uh, of mercury is required. So who cares? Um, it turns out that this is actually already probably a significant public health problem, but going to become a bigger public health problem. So classical or typical orthostatic hypotension is a major problem in the elderly. Um, it increases in frequency as people get older. And what this slide shows is that in the United States, using the nationwide inpatient sample, Dr. Chabal, a colleague from Vanderbilt, showed that the number of hospitalizations starts increasing exponentially uh, once patients reach the age of 65 or older. Um, and that's combined with the fact that certainly in Europe and North America, and I think in many other parts of the world, the population is aging. So this is actually a problem now that's going to become a bigger problem. And we often talk about um, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And to be clear, that's not different than orthostatic hypotension. It's a subset of orthostatic hypotension. So the orthostatic hypotension describes physiology that can occur due to lots of things with the blood pressure uh, readings that we described. When we say neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, we're actually going a step further saying, yes, that's there, but specifically that's due to a problem with sympathetic nerves, with the sympathetic nervous system. And there's an inadequate release of norepinephrine or noradrenaline on standing that's leading to an inability to squish the blood vessels, to vasoconstrict adequately and to increase the heart rate adequately to maintain that blood pressure on standing. So this is, you know, critically important, but this is actually the orthostatic hypotension that most of us talk about uh, and think about. But there's more. And part of what I'm hoping to get across today is that not all orthostatic hypotension is the same. So classical orthostatic hypotension, the one I've been talking about is shown on top and is, is graphically uh, cartooned out, I guess, in panel A. Um, and we see that when uh, someone gets up, tilt, or stand fairly quickly, the blood pressure drops. And that's shown in the gray bar. The heart rate often doesn't change much because there's involvement of both limbs of the autonomic nervous system. In the middle, um, we have a description and a representation of delayed orthostatic hypotension. So this is a, a variant that was described probably a little over a decade ago um, by uh, Roy Freeman and Chris Gibbons um, at Harvard. And, and what they found was that there were some patients that uh, did drop their blood pressure to the threshold, below the threshold that we talked about, but it takes longer than three minutes, often in the spectrum of 10 minutes, sometimes even a little longer. So they can hold their pressure and then it's sort of, there's just a drift down. It takes longer to reach that threshold. There may be a slight heart rate increase. And what they found is that these patients uh, may have a milder form of the neurogenic process that leads to classical orthostatic hypotension. And these patients actually um, have a prognosis that worse than patients without this, right? So there is actually some pathology and it's similar and perhaps uh, on the spectrum towards classical orthostatic hypotension. So it shouldn't be ignored. And then there's initial orthostatic hypotension. So instead of being delayed, we're talking about something that occurs earlier. Um, and this is shown in cartoon C. Um, and this involves a bigger, deeper drop in blood pressure. So the threshold uh, classically described was a drop of 40 millimeters of mercury 
in systolic pressure, 20 millimeters mercury in diastolic pressure. And this occurs very quickly. It occurs within 15 seconds of standing and often recovers within a minute. So unlike the other forms that don't recover, this one does recover. It can be associated with a fairly prodigious tachycardia. Um, and importantly, this often occurs in young, otherwise healthy people. So this is actually very different. While classical and delayed go together in a similar patient population, this is a different group altogether. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So uh, the credit uh, for really advancing our understanding in this largely belongs with uh, Walter Wheeling, um, who is an eminent internist and physiologist in Amsterdam, who's, I think, uh, still trying to retire um, at this point. Uh, but he really furthered our understanding more than anyone else. And he described this initial orthostatic hypotension as a large transient decrease in blood pressure. Again, occurs very quickly within 15 seconds of standing. Associated with symptoms, right? We're not describing just physiology here. We're describing physiology that has an impact on people, a negative impact. And importantly, it occurs during an active stand. And what we mean by that is that um, if you look at the bottom panel here, this patient was tilted up. And if you look at the blood pressure trace, not much happens. So a tilt table test where we strap people in and basically say, we'll support you is passive. Whereas if someone has to actually stand up, they need to use their thigh muscles and their leg muscles to get them standing. And so if they, without the tilt, if they stand up, that's called an active stand. And you see this large but short-lived drop in blood pressure that recovers almost immediately. The mechanisms uh, aren't necessarily fully understood, but thought to be related to a rapid vasodilation in the leg that contracts um, due to that muscular effort, right? So it's thought that the actual muscle activation is critical to this. People have thrown out other mechanisms. They've thrown out uh, sort of a muscle pump reflex, a cardiopulmonary receptor reflex. There's some details here, but the time courses of these don't really align with the rapid onset and recovery that we see. And so the rapid vasodilation um, due to the muscle contraction related to presumably myogenic mechanisms is probably um, at this point the most convincing mechanism that we have for why this occurs. So again, you know, we always have to think about the, does this matter? Um, and I would argue it does, and, and I think it's often ignored or, or poorly understood. Um, but there was a recent study that came out a couple of years ago by Van Twist and colleagues, which uh, looked at referrals to syncope clinic for unexplained syncope and what the underlying cause was. And initial orthostatic hypotension, when thought about and investigated, was the second most common cause for these referrals. I will tell you, uh, anecdotally, we don't have published data on this, but I've been paying attention to this in my clinic for a few years now. And this is actually a very frequent cause of referrals. The reason it's not recognized that way by most people is that I never get a referral saying, please see this patient for initial orthostatic hypotension. These patients are referred uh, as having syncope, sometimes vasovagal syncope, sometimes just syncope, or referred even for POTS because of that high initial tachycardia that recovers. So they're misdiagnosed or misreferred. But when you chat with the patient and study the patient, the problem is actually initial orthostatic hypotension. And it does bother the patients, right? My waiting list is ridiculously long and patients are willing to put up with that and come anyway. I've had patients, including physicians uh, who've had this, come from out of province, travel 10, 12 hours to see me in clinic to discuss this issue. And that speaks to the concern that they have and the impact that this has on their life. One of the interesting things about this response when you talk to patients is that if they do feel lightheaded, uh, sometimes they can hold on and, and it'll go away. They'll get through that time. But if it's bad enough, they'll sometimes sit down. And when they stand up again, almost never does it happen the second time. So what do you do about this? And there are various approaches that have been suggested, and hopefully we can refine it a little bit. But I think the traditional teaching is, well, sit up or get up slowly. So go from a lying to a sitting position, then stand up, or just stand up in one swoop, but do it very slowly. The speed is the key. Um, coming back to Dr. Wheeling's work, he is a big advocate of uh, physical counterpressure maneuvers and different uh, orthostatic disorders, and, and he has 
um, advocated and studied that uh, in this situation as well. And, and Nazia will touch on a variant of this. Just to recap, uh, initial orthostatic hypotension, it really is something that you'll miss on a tilt table assessment. Um, it occurs during an active stand. The muscles need to contract um, and pull the patient up for this to, to happen. And importantly, um, it occurs the first time, but doesn't occur right away if you sit and stand again. Um, and that's something that Nausea uh, looked into in, in a bit more detail to understand why that was and, and what the implications of that could be. So with that, I want to uh, turn over the reins uh, to uh, Nausea to share some of the uh, phenomenal work she did to, I think, advance our understanding of this disorder, both what it is and what to do about it. Nausea? Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Raj. That was a great introduction to IOH. Um, yeah, so as Dr. Raj mentioned, I'll now be discussing some studies that I did throughout my master's thesis. So as Dr. Raj mentioned, an interesting thing about IOH is that symptoms often do not reoccur when individuals sit back down after standing and then stand again. So that led us into the first question that we wanted to answer about IOH, which was, is there a refractory period to the reflex underlying IOH? So the first study that we did, this was a proof of concept study that attempted to determine whether or not there was a refractory period to the muscle activation reflex underlying IOH, and if so, what the duration of that refractory period was. In this study, the participants performed a series of sit-to-stand maneuvers with varying durations of seated baseline times, ranging from a short 30-second sit to a long 20-minute sit before each stand. Our hypothesis was that a stand following a short 30-second sit would result in a smaller blood pressure drop compared to a long 20-minute sit. And participants in the study were instrumented with a 5-lead ECG and non-invasive arterial blood pressure finger cup, cuff and a brachial arm blood pressure cuff. Continuous heart rate and beat to beat blood pressure were recorded and stroke volume and systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output were estimated from those waveforms. So first off in the study, we looked at the drop in systolic blood pressure following each sit to stand. On the X axis here, we have each individual seated duration, which includes the short 30 second sit, the two minute, three, four, five, seven, and 10 minute sits, and finally the long 20 minute sit. And the y-axis represents the change in systolic blood pressure immediately after each stand. So these results indicate that a large drop in systolic blood pressure is not present following the 30-second sit, but returns following a two-minute sit, which suggests that the refractory period of, a reflex, of the reflex underlying IOH lies between 30 seconds and two minutes. And next, we explored the various hemodynamic changes following the short and long sit specifically, so in this figure, we have the drop in systolic blood pressure, once again on the y-axis, and then the short and long sits only on the x-axis. So these results indicate that um, the IOH blood pressure response can be blunted with the short sit. And when we look at the uh, figures more closely, we can see that at these two stands, we found that the large drop in systolic blood pressure was likely due primarily to a rapid decrease in systemic vascular resistance and secondarily to a decrease in stroke volume. Once we understood that a refractory period does exist in the response underlying IOH, our next question was, can this refractory period be exploited for treatment? Which leads us into our next study. So in this study, this was a physical intervention study targeted at exploring the efficacy of muscle preactivation before standing, as well as muscle tensing after standing as symptom management options for patients with IOH. Our hypothesis was that lower body muscle preactivation, or LBMP for short, prior to standing, as well as lower body muscle tensing, LBMT for short, after standing, would blunt the blood pressure drop seen in IOH and improve symptoms. So in this study, participants remained seated for 10 minutes and then performed the LBMP maneuver while still seated by bringing their knees up to their chest in a seated bicycle motion for about 30 seconds before standing. And then the LBMT maneuver was performed after standing, where the participants crossed their legs and tensed their lower body muscles for about 30 seconds while standing. Participants in this study were also instrumented, instrumented with a 5-lead ECG and non-invasive arterial blood pressure finger cuff, as well as the brachial arm blood pressure cuff. 
And again, continuous heart rate and B2B blood pressure recorded and, S and stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac output were estimated. In addition to these measurements, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt orthostatic symptom scores, or VOS, was also recorded immediately upon standing. This symptom rating used a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 reflected an absence of symptoms. Um, the patients were asked to rate the severity of nine symptoms, which included mental clouding, blurred vision, shortness of breath, rapid heartbeat, tremulousness, chest discomfort, headache, lightheadedness, and nausea. And in the sum of these scores, that each time point was used as a measure of symptom burden, where the lower scale re reflects the reduced symptom burden. So in this uh, figure here on the left, we have the drop in systolic blood pressure upon standing on the y-axis, and each sit to stand with or without intervention on the x-axis. In this study, we found that the large drop in systolic blood pressure typically seen upon standing in IOH is reduced following both LBMP, so the lower body muscle preactivation, as well as LBMT, so the muscle tensing after standing. Focusing on LBMP, we found that this reduction in the drop in systolic blood pressure was due to an increase in cardiac output. Now, when we look at the lower body muscle tensing more closely, we found that the reduction in systolic blood pressure uh, drop was due to a reduced drop in systemic vascular resistance, as well as an increase in stroke volume. And in addition to this, when we looked at the results of the VOS ratings, we found that both interventions, the LBMP through the knee raises, as well as the LBMT after standing by light crossing, both reduced pre sync B symptoms upon standing. So now we know that the muscle preactivation is effective in reducing symptoms of IOH, and muscle activation includes both muscle contraction as well as sympathetic activation. So we wanted to determine which of the two factors played the more important role in reducing the blood pressure drop and subsequently symptoms. So this was a physiological study looking at the relative roles of sympathetic activation and muscle contraction in IOH. The purpose of this study was to better understand the relative roles of sympathetic nervous system activation and skeletal muscle contraction in mitigating the IOH response. The interventions we used in the study to explore these sectors included the Serial 7 Mental Arithmetic Stress Test, which is a test designed to increase sympathetic activity by a mental stimulus, the Cold Presser Test, which was another test designed to increase sympathetic activity but by a pain stimulus, and finally, the Electrical Stimulation Intervention, which induces a passive muscle contraction. So our hypothesis was that inducing passive muscle contractions prior to standing would have a greater reduction in the blood pressure drop seen in IOH compared to simply increasing sympathetic activity. In this study, IOH participants performed sit to stand maneuvers with interventions that either increased sympathetic activity, which included the serial 7 stress test or the cold presser test, or an induced passive muscle contraction before standing. And then participants in the study were again instrumented with a 5 lead ECG, non-invasive arterial blood pressure finger cuff, and a brachial arm blood pressure cuff. And in addition to this, the Vanderbilt orthostatic symptom scores were also recorded immediately upon standing. In this study, data were analyzed at three different time points in the study. So the BSL values, the baseline values, were a 30 second average taken from the end of the 10 minute seated baseline, the intervention or the INTV values were a 30 second average taken during the intervention, which was performed at the end of the 10 minute seated baseline while still seated. And then the blood pressure nadir values were taken after standing at the lowest systolic blood pressure time point. So first off, we'll take a look at the effect on blood pressure when comparing the change in blood pressure from seated baseline time point to the blood pressure nadir time point. So in figure A, we have the change in systolic blood pressure from sitting to standing following the no intervention control stand, the serial 7, the cold presser, and the passive muscle contraction intervention through electrical stimulation. The results of this study show that the drop in systolic blood pressure was significantly reduced following all three interventions. For now, we'll focus on the two sympathetic activation tests, which was the serial 7 and the cold presser. So the blunted drop in, the, in systolic blood pressure from sympathetic activation by CO7 and cold pressure was likely caused by a reduction in the drop in, the, in systemic vascular resistance. However, when we look at the results of the patient reported symptoms reporting, the passive muscle contraction intervention through electrical stimulation, 
so the results in green, was the only intervention that showed symptom improvement. So this can be explained when we look at the change in systolic blood pressure from the intervention time point to blood pressure nadir. So here we're comparing the change in systolic blood pressure from the seated intervention to immediately after standing. So the results of this show that FES was the only intervention that resulted in a significantly smaller drop in blood pressure overall, as the two sympathetic activation interventions appeared to increase blood pressure during the interventions while still seated, which resulted in the blood pressure still dropping about the same amount as the control stand. But as it began at a higher point, this difference could not be detected unless we compare immediately before standing to after standing. So the results from this chapter suggest that both sympathetic activation as well as muscle contraction play an important role in the IOH reflex and both mitigate the overall drop in blood pressure, but through slightly different mechanisms. And the passive muscle contraction may be more clinically relevant as it reduces pre B symptoms as well as the blood pressure drop. And then finally, we have our qualitative study, which is where we wanted to gain insight into the patient experience of living with IOH to provide a deeper understanding of the day-to-day -day impacts and patient priorities of IOH. So this study consisted of a one-on-one -on -one phone interview where patients were asked to describe how IOH affected their day-to-day -day life, what the social, emotional, and financial implications of IOH were, and to identify different patient priorities. So the key findings of this study was that IOH affects many aspects of day-to-day -day life, from family life to social life to work, and as and even mental health. Specifically, the study showed that some IOH patients had to alter large parts of their day-to-day -day life because of their symptoms, such as missing family vacations and no longer being able to drive in fear of fainting. This resulted in feelings of loss and a reduced quality of life. Some participants also expressed that IOH contributed to feelings of depression and anxiety. An important theme that arose from the study was that participants felt that IOH was an invisible disorder, which made it difficult for them to talk about it with their friends and family and even physicians. This prevented some participants from seeking help when their symptoms began. And in addition to that, since IOH is a relatively underrecognized disorder, when patients did work up the courage to seek help, many patients had to visit multiple doctors to receive a diagnosis if they received one at all. Finally, an overwhelming theme that arose that almost every participant agreed on was that an official diagnosis was one of the most important things to them in their journey with IOH. This not only validated their experience, but also provided them with a better understanding of what they were experiencing. Participants reported that with a diagnosis and a symptom management techniques from physicians, they could begin their journey of managing IOH and return to their normal lives. So a few limitations from these studies were that all participants in the physiological studies, so the first three parts, were female. So it's likely these participants are not fully representative of all individuals with IOH. Many patients were selected and enrolled based on subjective self-reported symptoms. Due to this, we were unable to confirm diagnosis of IOH with blood pressure measurements until after they consented and began the in-person study. And the data collected in the qualitative study were all subjective self-reported data based on participants' perception of their own experience. However, the methods we used to analyze and extract the themes from the data were validated, so the risk of bias should have been minimized. So future studies among patients with symptomatic IOH should include sex match participants to evaluate whether there are any sex-specific differences in the refractive period, underlying mechanisms, and efficacy of muscle preactivation. Future studies should also explore the efficacy of combining lower body muscle preactivation with the post-tensing to determine if a combination of the two treatments could further improve symptoms of IOH. And for the clinical implications of these studies, the LBMP and LBMT maneuvers studied were effective symptom management options that IOH patients can utilize whenever they stand up and can be recommended by physicians to IOH patients. And an important next step is to increase awareness of IOH in the public as well as with physicians. The quality of study illustrated that many participants visited multiple physicians without being officially diagnosed. So quick and accurate diagnosis of IOH could not only improve the patient experience, but it would also reduce the burden on the healthcare system from repeated visits to clinics. So in conclusion, the reflex underlying IOH has a refractory period of less than two minutes. IOH can be blunted with a short sit, 
Both LBMP and LBMT blunt the drop in systolic blood pressure and improve symptoms of IOH. Um, and sympathetic activation and muscle activation blunts the IOH response. And IOH affects many aspects of patient life and should be a more widely recognized disorder. So thank you, Nazia, so for, for the summary of the work that you've done. Um, I think I think Nazia's conclusions stand on their own. Um, I want to just add a couple, I guess, from a clinic perspective. Um, I think one of the important things that Nazia showed is that um, while it's perhaps not every person that gets a little lightheaded, there's a significant group of patients um, who suffer from this and by suffer have negative impacts on the quality of life. And I think as physicians, it's on us to think about this diagnosis and be open to uh, helping to address it. Um, the second is that um, we do have some understanding of the physiology. This refractory period um, that we've come on or found um, can be exploited therapeutically, and, and we've been doing this in clinic. And so this isn't just a matter of nausea as data, but um, our clinic experience uh, has been to educate patients about the refractory period uh, and specifically to try and get them to preactivate their muscles, to dissociate this um, response from muscle activation from the fluid shifts that occur when standing up. Um, and that does seem to decrease the symptoms significantly, um, which is a big part of what they want. So we identify the disorder and we give them a treatment that's cheap, easy, and non-drug uh, to help it. Um, and the third is in terms of trying to document this, this is impossible to do with our traditional blood pressure measurement techniques. Um, I know uh, several people, Roseanne Kenny has been um, one of the leaders of this, have ad been advocating for us to update the way we think about blood pressure. Um, that the, you know, blood pressure cuff technology is, is hundreds of years old. And while we've had advances in a lot of medicine, we seem to still think of blood pressure as something static and long term. And, and for aspects of it, that's valid. But for a disorder like IOH, which can clearly be symptomatic and burdensome, we really need technology that will give us more rapid uh, and beat-to-beat -beat assessment of blood pressure. And this is a good example of that type of disorder that really impacts patients. So with that, uh, I want to thank um, some of our colleagues and some of the people in the lab that uh, helped make this work possible. Um, I want to thank... Uh, you all for actually hanging in there uh, with us uh, and uh, and listening to this. Um, we're going to have uh, one more polling question that Haley will give you, and then Nazia and I are available for uh, a live chat after this. Thank you again. Thank you both so much, Dr. Raj and Nazia, for that fantastic presentation. Um, first up, is this really a problem? Doesn't this just happen to everybody every once in a while? Yes and no. Um, you know, I guess, you know, if you actually take a step back, one can take a philosophical view of syncope in general. There's lots of good data now that 40% perhaps of the population will faint at some point in their life. Um, and 40%, you can question, is that really a problem? And one would argue for the person that faints once in a life, it's probably not a huge thing that we need to medicalize in a big way. But about half of those people will faint more than once in their life. And then a smaller percentage will faint frequently and incessantly. And so I think, you know, if this happens, you know, with very mild lightheadedness and it's a, a very rare event and you hold on, you move on, then no, I, I certainly am not uh, advocating that everyone that gets a bit lightheaded rush to come and see me in clinic. But there are patients in whom this happens frequently, in whom this happens uh, to the point where they're actually having syncope, to whom they actually modify their activities or avoid activities because of concern about this. And in at least one, actually it's not just one, in, in some cases, not as common, young mothers who are afraid of holding their children, their babies, because they're afraid of dropping them because of this. So I think for some people it is a problem. Um, and, and that needs to be understood, validated, and, and I guess most importantly, we can help them treat it. Yeah, that's a really good point. 
Um, and then another question that we have here, um, this one relates more to different populations that this seems to happen to. So the person's asking or rather stating endurance athletes and other athletes seem to experience this quite often. Um, can you comment on maybe why this is? Yes, I, I, I certainly don't have any specific data on it, but we think that the, this reaction is triggered um, you know, with the initial large muscle activation, with thigh muscle activation, and a sudden shift in blood flow. Um, and uh, I suspect that highly trained athletes uh, probably um, are able to shift blood um, to these large muscles that they'd be using, you know, in their in their sport um, more efficiently than than I would. But that's purely speculation. That there are brilliant exercise physiologists that study. Uh, those athletes in detail, and I haven't done so. Okay. Um, uh, let's see what else. Um, another question here. Do you ever measure respiration during orthostatic testing? Not routinely. And, okay. and perhaps we should more. I mean, I think we we are getting more interested in um, issues around hyperventilation. Julian Stewart has done some nice work pointing out that, that this might be an issue. Can IOH be used as a proxy marker of sympathetic tone? Um, I can take this one. So I guess in a way, yes. Um, so the reason that IOH is transient and it recovers on its own is because it's usually occurring in people who are otherwise healthy. So generally their autonomic system is intact. So if for example, someone's blood pressure didn't recover, there could be a, a number of reasons for it, and one of them could be that their sympathetic activity isn't increasing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, it doesn't necessarily tell us for sure that it's the sympathetic tone that's um, faulty. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any sex differences in the prevalence of OH, and is this consistent across subtypes? You've mentioned that IOH is often more common in young people, um, so there's clearly some age differences here. Um, for IOA specifically, at least for our study, we weren't able to study any males, but we did find that over 90% of the volunteers that we had were female, but we would have to look into um, the males as well to see if there are sex differences specifically in IOH. Wonderful. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's brilliant data on this. I, I mean, so I was going to say from our clinic, I, I think there's probably a slight female predominance, but but it's certainly not as highly skewed as some disorders like postural tachycardia syndrome. We definitely see this in, in males. It definitely skews more to younger folks that are often otherwise quite healthy um, than, than older folks. Right. Um, another question here. You've not said anything about fluid status. Surely this is also relevant. I guess I'll handle this. I wasn't sure if Nazio wanted to jump in. So yeah. we, we didn't formally assess fluid status. Um, I will say in terms of our treatment approaches, um, because of our clinic in general and the disorders we see, I am a big fan of good hydration um, and perhaps excessive hydration in general. Um, but I must say, in terms of the treatment approach for these patients, I push that a lot less than some of these maneuvers that Nazia was speaking about. Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's yeah. data on whether the hydration status, what direct effect that has. Yeah, we didn't look into that in our study, but, um, and I haven't found anything in literature for IOH specifically, but it's been suggested that it could be a possibility, but on that for IOH. Okay. Nazia, you mentioned something about the VOS rating system. Can you briefly explain a little bit more about what this is? Yeah, so it's in orthostatic um, symptoms rating. So what happens is when the patients stand up, we ask them to rate a, um, nine different symptoms on a scale from zero to 10. So zero being they don't experience symptoms at all, 10 being they experience it the most. So yeah, it's just, it's a good indicator of the burden of symptoms that they're experiencing after each stand. Perfect, thank you so much for that clarification. That um, 
I think so. Um, so we've got a nice comment here, very nice presentation, um, followed by the question, is this a condition that can go away by time? So can a patient grow out of this? And is it similar to, well, I guess you've already mentioned this, that it's similar to POTS where it affects mostly females, but can people grow out of, um, grow out of this? Um, yeah, so again, in literature, it, it's typically, it typically occurs in young adults. So it does seem to go away as people grow um, age. And then it does re reappear in the elderly patients. So we haven't looked into elderly patients, but um, yeah, it does seem to go away after some time. Perfect. Um, let's see, since IOH is so transient, could it be detected without using a Nexvin, but with manual arm blood pressure cuffs instead? Um, yeah, I can take the this. history, um, so... the clinical history can be picked up. Oh. Go ahead, Nazia. Oh, okay. Um, I was just gonna say there's, um, there is a paper that was, I think, published in like about 2015 that did look into trying to diagnose it with, um, the manual arm blood pressure cuff. And they found that they could do it if they pre-inflated the cuff. But that, again, it's it's so transient that you could sometimes be missing it if you, you were using a manual arm blood pressure cuff. So I think the finger finger blood pressure or the continuous beat to beat would be the best way to diagnose it, aside from the history taking that Dr. Marsh mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think if you want if you want the physiology, if you want to prove that the pressure dropped beyond a certain threshold, you need continuous beat to beat blood pressure. Presumably non-invasively, in theory, an art line would work, although the patients probably won't come back to see you ever again. Um, but the history is, is fairly typical. Um, and uh, when patients get that history, um, we'll often advise, even if we don't have rigorous hemodynamic documentation. Okay. Um, which sensor-based technique is used in these clinical investigations? And did you use any IR-based sensors? Yeah, so I assume you're referring to near-infrared, and, and the answer is no. Um, we didn't use that. I, I think uh, Nausea didn't show the data and, and may still be playing with it, but we, we did have, I believe, transcranial Doppler. But, but obviously, most of the data that we presented was from ECG and from the continuous blood pressure. There, there is a recent okay. paper uh, looking at sort of mirrors with a similar stand maneuver for a slightly different purpose. Um, and as that technology becomes more ubiquitous, it, there may be interesting findings there as well with what's going on with the front part of your brain oxygenation. Okay. Um, do patients with IOH experience symptoms every day, every stand, every few days or less? Can some days be worse than others? Um, so I would say it differs from patient to patient and day to day. Some people experience it maybe like a couple times a week or a couple times a month, whereas other people may experience it almost every time that they stand up. So it can definitely differ between patients. And even within patients, some days can be worse than others. Sure. And I imagine this probably um, would would cause some um, some challenges in, uh, in the clinic for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. Is there a moderate or strong correlation between IOH and vasovagal responses? Um, I haven't quite looked into that, so I'm not no, sure. Do you want to share your one experience? Oh, I guess, like, so I, one I don't, time... I don't know how the correlation is, but they... Oh, go ahead, Nausea. I guess, like, the participant who fainted during our study, or... Yeah, so so I mean there is there is definitely an overlap, right? So these, I, the presence of IOH doesn't preclude vasovagal syncope and, and doesn't preclude POTS, um, but it's a different presentation. Um, in nausea study, there's actually someone that did have a vasovagal episode um, during her study, um, which she enjoyed greatly. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's an enriched population. Right, so there's overlap, it's not exclusionary, but I, I don't know that um, the vast majority, I don't think the vast majority have necessarily vasovagal syncope of, of any frequency. Mm 
Okay, next question here. What is the severity of IOH in type two diabetes patients? I can't say I, I can't say that I've ever looked into that or come across that, but we did have one patient who did have diabetes as well in our study, but beyond that, I couldn't say. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think um, if, if maybe like, this... we've had patients with oh, IOH with type with type. I'm, I'm trying to think if we've had patients sort of clinically with type two diabetes. And I think it's possible. I think it's less common for two reasons. One, um, patients with type 2 diabetes often are a bit older. They're often sort of, you know, getting into middle age or older where um, this is a bit less common. And, and the the specific uh, pathology that I expect more, be more concerned about is, is the classical orthostatic hypotension, the specifically neurogenic orthostatic hypotension in the diabetic patient. Okay. Um... Do you have any experience or can share any outcomes um, with COVID-19 patients and IOH? Yeah, we're, we're starting to see more Sorry. COVID patients with, with uh, autonomic and orthostatic complaints in general. Um, I'd say I've seen a lot more with, with a POTS-like presentation and, and orthostatic intolerance that's not just transient. Um, we are uh, very soon to embark on a study to try um, to look at how frequent these different disorders, including IOH, including classical OH, including sort of the orthostatic tachycardia that would meet criteria for POTS are in some of these COVID, so-called long haul COVID patients. Okay. Um, what about, maybe you can comment on any modifications that you could make to the testing protocol. So this person is asked how to test patients with spinal cord injury who cannot stand. Is it possible to modify the, the testing protocol? I, I think for IOH specifically, so I guess because it's due to... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, keep going. No, I was just going to say that like the main, I guess, reflex of IOH is that it's a large muscle activation reflex in, in the lower body. So if they're unable to perform that, you wouldn't get the rapid base dilation that occurs from the act of standing in, in a spinal cord injury patient. I would, I would, I mean, I would add two things. One, spinal cord injury patients are certainly prone to orthostatic hypotension, but it would be a much more I expect it to be much more the classical orthostatic hypotension, um, where the problem isn't a transient reflex, but the problem is the nerve connections themselves um, providing, I guess, being unable to provide sort of adequate vasoconstriction. And I'd leave it, okay. I'd leave it at that, except to say one more thing, and that is that if the patients don't have symptoms, it's, it becomes a non-issue. Right. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, we are going to wrap up with one last question. Um, do you ever see orthostatic hypoten hypotension as part of a syndrome similar to POTS? Um, yeah, I think I think Dr. Raj can speak on this more, but he does get a lot of people in for POTS who actually have IOH. And there was also a study that looked into how common it is for patients with POTS to have IOH and vice versa. And it is quite common actually for people to have both. Yeah, you definitely, I mean, there, there, there are two, two uh, issues with this. One, patients can definitely have both, or I, I mean, I've certainly seen patients with IOH POTS and basovagal syncope. So you, you, they certainly can have multiple versions of these. Not, But I'm not sure they, they all do. There are lots of POTS patients that really have their symptoms um, only chronically and not acutely. Um, the other part of it is that, and we while we focus on the drop in blood pressure, um, in uh, many people there's a reflex tachycardia, and I think in um, some patients there can be an excessive reflex orthostatic tachycardia that can be measured. You know, if you just did a one minute stand and measure the pressure, the heart rate I think lags behind, and, and we often get a tachycardia at one minute in some patients that settles as they keep standing. Um, and I think that's sometimes misdiagnosed as POTS. If, if, the, if the heart rate comes down and settles and not symptomatic for the rest of the 10 minutes, 
Um, that initial tachycardia should not be diagnosed as POTS, but I think sometimes is when it's really due to the IOH and the, the reflux tachycardia. So I think there are two reasons for the association, but, but certainly POTS patients can have this also. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, uh, Nazia and Dr. Raj, both for all of your insights today in the presentation, as well as in this Q&A session. Um, and of course, a very big thank you to Finipress Medical Systems for making this event possible. In closing, thank you again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar. We look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day.